If you know anything about what GRI has been up to the last year, you certainly know that we've been really working hard in community resilience, which is the area that Warren and I want to talk with you about today. It's the area that for close to 15 years we've been working in. It was, I guess, uh, one of the things that uh, brought us together as colleagues uh, back in our Oak Ridge days. So. Most, many of you have seen this picture. It uh, comes from Mexico Beach in Florida after the uh, Hurricane Michael. I notice there's one house standing, literally the picture of one man standing. And we talk about this a lot because it captures in a picture what resilience looks like. And we, resilience is a term that uh, when we first started working in this 15 years ago, almost no one used it in a sentence. You couldn't find many people that were not material scientists or psychologists, um, an occasional ecosystems person who would talk about resilience. Um, these days, resilience has become a very trendy term. And uh, it's almost a zeitgeist of the 21st century. It is something that everyone says they're doing a resilient something or other. If they're making coffee filters, you can look for resilience somewhere in the characteristics of what they're selling. Uh, and I think there's a reason it, it is a term uh, of the day, and that is because it expresses something that we all recognize and, are, and respond to. Uh, when Warren and I first began working in this, and, and a little bit of what we're going to talk to you about today is kind of how this practice around community resilience has coalesced over the last decade. But when we first started talking about it, people would go, well, I, you know, that, I think that's good, resilience, that's, yeah, mm -hmm, we're for that. And meetings devolved almost immediately into arguments among all the various disciplines about what the definition was. And they would argue over whether it was adaptive or mitigative, or is it protecting or preventing. And one of the things we learned almost immediately is, while people might want to argue over specific words in a definition, everybody recognized it when they saw it. And part of the reason that's important is because it is a way that we choose consciously and unconsciously where we're going to live, where we're going to work, and where we want to play. And communities that are resilient win in the location choice sweepstakes. Communities that are not don't and very often can't. So what we began years ago uh, on, a, on an ask from a congressional um, group that had communities that had been just decimated by Katrina, help us understand what resilience is and why some communities are resilient and others are not. That was the tasking ask that we were given. My first personal um, encounter with resilience was actually before uh, Warren and I met, I was still running nonproliferation programs in Oak Ridge. And the national security world in those days was really concerned about radiologic threats and dirty bombs and what happens if bad actors have something go off in the Super Bowl or it happens at a big shopping mall or what, you know. And I went to them and trotted out all of our technical capabilities, the people in the masks, the funny suits, the things that go, you know, blink, and all the, we can gather it up in this and we can do that, and in the end, it'll all be gone, no problem. And the community leaders who were there went, oh, well, now that was fascinating. Thank you so much. But um, let us ask this question one more time. What are you going to do about this? And I thought, oh, well, they just don't understand. And we went back through, this is does this, and that blinks and does that, and this process is X, and we're going to do Y. And, and they were like, no, you don't understand. And what you don't understand is if a bad thing like that happens, 
no matter what technology you use to clean it up, how are we going to get our citizens to come back? Because we don't believe they'll ever come back to a Super Bowl that has been damaged in that way or a shopping mall. We'll just have to knock it down and start over. And that question sent me home to talk not to the people who had the gadgets and the glow in the dark and all that, but to the social sciences and the policy people to say, okay, how are we going to get them to come back? And so that was my introduction to the idea that we actually discovered was, oh, they're talking about resilience. How do you take a licking and keep on ticking? And what we're going to talk to you about today is that sort of journey that we made intellectually and in practice about understanding and discovering what makes communities resilient and what we're doing here at GRI to try to leverage what we've learned and help communities become more resilient. So with that, I'm going to let Warren start with what resilience is. And we're going to make the clicker thing work for both of us. Well, the first thing we need to do is stop and have a 40-minute discussion on definitions of resilience, because Robin has already told you that that's how we used to do this all the time. Uh, as we began to think about this, we needed a framing mechanism. We needed some way to frame this problem so that we could talk to a wide variety of people about, about resilience and, and about societal resilience, because pretty soon we were realized we were not talking about one of those stovepipe definitions. We weren't talking about how paper clips begin to look like paper clips again after you've stretched them out of shape, or how the frog pond starts producing frogs again after it's had some sort of ecological disaster. We're really talking about all of that and, and, and how society bounces back after a disturbance. And we came across from a, um, I don't think her name's on here right now, from a researcher at, at the Department of Homeland Security handed me one day a loss recovery curve, a simply simple loss recovery. It didn't look like this. We've sort of modified this because it's a little easier to understand for just regular. I know that you're not a regular audience. But for average people that we talk to, uh, this is a good way to understand it. It really seems to be a pretty simple chart. But in fact, there's a lot of information contained on that chart, or there's a lot of ways to frame resilience that are contained on there. And, and all the chart really simply does is it says, Communities or regions have a, a, a functionality that can be measured. You, you can think of this as a capacity. So this is the capacity of their systems, their capacity of their functions, their capacity of all the community. To come. Could be their economic capacity, something we can measure in some way. It could be social capacity in some way. It could be transportation capacity. But they have a, a, a capacities, and these capacities tend to run constant across time. Uh, now, they'll go up and down a little bit depending on, you know, you get a new factory in your town, it employs a lot of new people, then your economic capacity may go up. Of course, your water capacity may go down if you haven't planned for that well. But in fact, the capacity tends to remain the same until the, there's something that happens to it, some sort of acute disturbance that happens. Now, that used to say disaster. But disaster can mean so many things to so many different people. Which is, and I tell the story sometimes because it's, it's just interesting. Early on, we did a deep dive into three southern cities. And one of those cities was Charleston, South Carolina. Great town. Uh, and we thought that Charleston was a pretty resilient place. And so I was talking to the mayor of Charleston. Now, Mayor Joe Riley was a mayor of Charleston for over 40 years. Uh, and so he was really a dean of mayors across the United States. And I went in to talk to Mayor Riley and explain to him what we were doing. And he said, why Charleston? And I said, well, we think Charleston's pretty, pretty resilient because we watched how you went through Hurricane Hugo. Uh, and in fact, you've bounced back from that really, really well. You're a much different city you were then. And Mayor Riley said, yeah, I think you're right, but you have the wrong disaster. Well, he's a pretty old guy like me, but I didn't think he remembered the 1886 earthquake. Uh, so I said, Mayor Riley, what disaster do you think is important? He said, in 1993, the Defense Department said, we're, we're removing your Navy base. And in 1996, it was gone. Well, that opened up a whole new aperture for us because then it wasn't just about natural disasters. It was about all the things that happened to communities. It was about economic disasters. It was about social disasters. It was about really just the constant change and turbulence that cities are facing today. So, so what happens when you have that acute disturbance, whatever it looks like natural disaster is, that capacity begins to fall off. 
It'll fall off differently for each function. It'll fall off differently for each system. It'll fall off differently depending on what the disaster is. So a pandemic is going to affect the city different than a tidal wave is going to affect the city or, or than a terrorist incident is going to affect the city. But, it, but it's going, you're going to lose capacity of those, those functions that the, that the community has uh, to go forward. And then they're going to come back. And they're going to come back on some slope that, and, and that's is really what we're trying to do. We're trying to influence that slope. We're trying to determine how can we turn that recovery faster, how can we make the recovery more, more vibrant, so that not only can you return, uh, it, this would be sort of a resilient community. I return to where I was. I'm as good off as I was. This would be a really resilient city. I got back better than I was because when I rebuilt I didn't rebuild the way I was. I rebuilt, in fact, better than I was. And, and this is kind of some of the cities. I, I would argue that this is New Orleans today. New Orleans has never really made it back to where it was to begin with because there were factors that induced that resilience. So as we started looking at how we kind of measure this, how we kind of structure this, one of the things that we realized, and I always express it this way, I'm not sure it, it works for everybody, but it does for me. Resilience is a tremendously horizontal problem. Okay? It stretches across every function, every system, everything that's out there in a community. It just pervades all of them. But we are constantly trying to apply very vertical solutions to it. I'm going to fix the electric grid. Well, that's great. I fixed the electric grid, but I didn't do something else. Or I broke something else when I was fixing the electric grid. So what we realized is what we really needed to talk about and what this expressed was, no matter how well we could measure each one of those systems, each one of those things that were out there, we were really talking about the functionality. So we are really talking about functions. We call them very early on, and still do when we talk to cities, we call them services. We actually say you live in a community because you get services that you can't get some other way. Okay, So you get social services, you get economic services, you get energy services, you get food services. All of those things are things you can't do on your own, and they come together in that community, and they provide those functions that the community provides to you. Now, some of them are provided by government. Some of them are provided by um, private uh, corporations, as a matter of fact, many of them are provided by the private business sector, and, and others are provided by uh, organizations that are out there. But it's that functionality, it's looking at this from a functional standpoint, rather than trying to measure each one of those systems that we thought was really important as we went forward. So again, what we're trying to do is impact the slope of that curve, and, and, and how can we do this? Let me just add too, we, we, because we use terms like function and service that I think it's important to remind you, these are not transactional. So a service area has to do with the natural environment, right? That means that's not a transaction, but it can be an important element of how that city meets the needs and desires of its residents, right? So if you ask people, why do you live in um, what's a town in Cape Cod? If, why do you live in Sandwich? Other than I found out they have a fabulous museum. Um, because my family lives in Cape Cod and we want to be on Cape Cod, right? That actually becomes an important element, believe it or not, in the resilience of the community. So don't think about functions or services as just a transactional kind of thing. It's an area that is expressed in the community's ability to meet the needs and desires of the residents and businesses and organizations that choose to be there, okay? That's a very important distinction from systems analysis because a system looks at a connected set of transactional assets. Okay, go ahead. Right, next slide. So this is a very so this becomes very complex. It looks like a simple chart, but in fact, one of the things we need to understand is the realities that are facing our communities today. 
Because if we don't actually understand what the communities are facing and can't see this from the community standpoint, then we sort of take a top-down approach and we believe we can measure everything on that curve and we can look at how the functions influence each other in a transactional way. And we don't really, you know, it doesn't really get us to what are we going to tell the community they actually need to do? Because we can go out there and explain that chart and we can explain functions all day, but at some point the mayor is going to look at you and say, okay, I got it. What do you want me to do now? And so we really have to understand their life. And, and here's a list of them, and I'm, you, you know them probably as well as I do. Communities are becoming much more complex. It's hard for us to see that because it looks like they're becoming much more simple. So I used to have to walk to the grocery store. Now I can go on my app and I can order somebody and they will bring the groceries to my house. If I have an app and if I have a cell phone, and if I have the resources that are necessary to do that because I have a job that allows me to have all of those things. So simple becomes complex fairly, fairly soon. I used to go down when I grew up to the hardware store to get everything that I needed from the local hardware store. But in fact, that local hardware store was locally owned. Now it's Home Depot if I go down there at all, and it isn't locally owned. So the decisions aren't made in my hometown. They're made down in Atlanta, Georgia, maybe, or maybe they're made by a supplier somewhere else. So all of this adds complexity to what's going on in the community, even while we perceive that things are getting simpler. Break any one of those links, and you can see how complex this can be. Rate of change, for you may be fast, for me it's unimaginable. I mean, there, there are things that we do that I can't imagine that I actually checked in for my airline yesterday afternoon on a phone and got my seats and all of that was done. I know that's just common to you, but that used to be something that a travel agent did. And that rate of change is happening so fast that communities particularly who have to make investment decisions based on what, what they can see today and what they can see of tomorrow are having a real hard time keeping up with that. There is a whole new spectrum of risk, uh, whether, it, whether it's the risk of terrorism, which I do not believe is existential, but whether there's the risk of terrorism or just uh, of the fact that in an interconnected world, uh, diseases can move faster than we've ever seen before and we're not even sure how they're coming. So there is a whole new spectrum of risk that even the community, not just the nation, has to pay attention to. There are clear global economic shifts and we're seeing that now. I talked about the hardware store. I used to go down and kind of everything came locally and now it comes from Home Depot, but Home Depot supply chain goes all the way back and you know, it, let's don't even talk about Amazon, which their supply chain is so complex and I don't, I certainly can't understand it, but they get stuff there fast. But the problem is, is all of that has shifted the economy in ways that we're are having, those who deal in the economy all the time are having trouble sort of working with and figuring out. And so, again, if you're thinking about this as the average mayor having to deal with it or the average city leader having to deal with it, you can understand how that begins. Demographic shifts, this nation is getting older. Uh, this nation is getting more of color. This nation is, is, is not reproducing itself as it it's going to rely on Im immigrants, whether we like that or not, or whether anybody likes that or not. More and more, that's the way we're going to replenish our population. Uh, we're going to deal with an older population with fewer young people to support that population if we don't. That worries me a lot. I need you guys working. I really do, so that I can quit. <laughs> um, but, so we've, but all of those demographic shifts are, are really important and, and, and that the mayor has to deal with. And then we've built up a set of unrealistic expectations across the nation. We, we have said often, we have trained America to be saved. So if there is a disaster out there, we have carefully trained America to be, to be rescued. Uh, because we, and, and it's easy to say, if, if, again, if you're the mayor, it's really easy to say, hey, you need to have three days supply of food in your house that you can count on, and you need to have a full tank of gas all the time, and you need to be able to have water in your house so that when the hurricane comes or, or the disaster comes. But the fact is, is if you're having trouble putting the next meal on the table, it's really hard to figure out how you've got three days' worth of food in the pantry uh, to do this. So we've got to figure out how to make communities themselves uh, more resilient so that they can survive these kinds of things without waiting for the federal government or other governments to come and help. It used to be that a disaster declaration was a really big thing. 
when the president did a disaster, he probably did two a year, maybe, 10 years ago. And now I have no idea how many there were last year. I'm sure there were 60 or 70 uh, uh, last year. And so th that, that we just, you know, we, the nation can't sustain that. And let me say, while, you know, climate change and those things are affecting the rapidity of disruption in some cases, it's not just a climate change phenomenon. The other reason that we have more pre presidential declarations is because we are a nation that expects to be rescued. So how many of you have an emergency plan for you and your house or your roommate that if we get a bad storm like Superstorm Sandy and much of Boston floods, or we have a horrible winter snowstorm like we had three or four years ago where everything stopped dead. How many of you have a plan for how you will feed yourself in your apartment or how you will get from your apartment to another location where you can be safe and fed? How many of you have that plan? The, the hands that are raised just for your own edification are like, <laughs> right? And, and now, what that, look around. You're sitting in the Global Resilience Institute in a university that has said resilience is one of the societal imperatives of the 21st century. And we don't even have close to 100% of the hands in this room who have a plan that will allow them to be resilient for events which we know are likely to happen in this area. Which is why Warren and I are saying we have created a societal mentality that someone else, who usually is known as the emergency manager, this is an apocryphal individual in theory, he exists in fact, but our expectations make him mythic. He can do all things, be all places, be instantaneous, be fully resourced, although they're usually funded at about 10% of what they need. And that, that person is going to rescue us, our family, our goods, our property, and our normal way of living. So when we talk about the realities facing our communities, we're talking about you as either part of the solution or part of the problem. And I tell all of our research folks here, part of what you get anointed with is when you leave this gig, you have to be a resilience disciple. Wherever you go, if you're running Wall Street, if you're doing medicine, if you're modeling infrastructure, whatever you do, we want you to be a person who thinks about resilience, who understands how it affects your domain, and who models and behaves in resilient ways. See me for suggestions if you need any. Okay, back to you. Teacher has spoken. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, so we, we, as we started talking with communities, and, and I'll give you just a little bit of history. As we began to go out, we talked to literally hundreds of people. This was 12 years ago uh, or so, hard to, hard to believe it, but uh, 12, 15 years ago. Uh, we talked to hundreds of people, mayors, emergency managers, governors, uh, private business owners, religious business leader, I mean, uh, religious uh, leaders. Uh, we really talked to a lot of people. And, and, and we did a deep dive in three different cities to sort of look at their resilience and begin to understand it. And we looked at lots of literature that was being done, and we looked at lots of disasters that were out there. And a couple of few truths kind of jumped out that kind of began to also help us shape the program, or at least help us shape how we engaged communities in the program. And one of them is, is you can't scare people into preparedness. Okay, you just can't do it. We've been telling horror stories all along. We tell the stories about Katrina. We tell stories about Superstorm Sandy. We tell stories about 9-11. Uh, uh, we tell stories about all sorts, and, and people don't react to that. You can't scare people into doing this. You, you've, got to get them in, you've got to get them energized in another way. Uh, now, messaging becomes tremendously important, and how you message this to different groups, it, you know, so if, if you want to talk to young parents, you talk about taking care of their kids and saving their kids because they understand that. 
If you want to talk to college students, I don't know. What do you talk about? Do you talk about saving your grades? <laughs> no, but 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 the point is, the point is, is you've really got to you've really got to craft the message well. I'd love to hear that interchange. Um, <laughs> the the other one is 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 you're not just recovering after an incident. You're actually preparing for what's next, or what you need to be doing is preparing for what's next. So it's not just a recovery exercise because something else is going to happen. And by the way, the next one is not going to be like the last one. So if you lived on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi from, say, 2000 forward, you saw a small economic downturn. Okay? Then you saw a massive hurricane that destroyed a, an awful lot. And as you were coming back from that, you saw another economic downturn. Then you had a gigantic oil spill that you had to deal with. And so every one of those has kind of put you on the sine wave of, you know, I'm up or about to get up, and now I'm back down again. And none of those were like each other. And every one of them required different responses. Takes a community, and we're going to talk about more about what it looks like, I mean, because it takes a community to do this. You can't just fix, you can't just turn to the emergency manager and say, emergency manager, go fix this, because he can't do it. You can't turn to the power supplier and say, I want a resilient power system, because that won't make a resilient community. You, you really have to take the, whole, the entirety of the community to do that. And then the really hard part, because this is what makes it so hard to scale is, is there are rhythms to every community, and each community has got to sing its own song. Uh, there's no way to, to make a template and just say everybody, it, it, this is why it becomes so hard to make a checklist. I mean, all we would love to do is make a checklist, hand it to every city, say do the 37 things on this checklist and you will be resilient, and it just doesn't work because every community is, is different, and each, each incident, each disturbance is going to affect the community different. So what we wanted to do, we're using this picture to give you a sense of the way that we took that functional curve and looked at uh, the community and began to put together tools that would help both us and communities understand what makes them resilient and what doesn't. So Warren's talked about this functional expression and it covers everything that's in the community. We looked at a, uh, actually, Warren, I wanted to, no, that's right. Um, we looked at what are the ways that we can help a community look at itself and make decisions. So we put together a, a set of decision models that actually use collaborative wisdom. One of the things that we found right away, if I went into a community and said, do you have a disaster recovery plan? What, what is your major? Okay, this is the leader of the medical uh, system in this community. And I just asked her, do you have a disaster recovery plan? And I'm gonna guess as a health person, you're gonna say, yeah, we have one, right? My hospital and my doctor, right? And I, I would say, well, do you have one for the whole city? Now, most people would say, Without fail, I'm telling you I've done this in a zillion places. The second question, the answer is, we do have one. I know we do. And I'll say, who has that? And then I get, um, well, the emergency manager has that. Okay, have you seen it? No. Do you know that he has it? We sh we're pretty sure, right? <laughs> And they usually at that point name him. Joe has it. Joe has that. Well, have you, do you know what's in it? What you're supposed to do to help from the health side? But he does, <laughs> right? Okay. That's no, that's no plan. One of my favorite quotes is, we live out the surprise results of old plans. Do we not? Or, or, or worse than that we have a plan that doesn't make any sense. So we were at a major university <laughs> on the West Coast, which will remain unnamed. 
And we were walking across the campus of this major university on the West Coast, which will remain unnamed. And there were a bunch of new students, or uh, prospective students, that were getting an orientation and a tour around the campus. And they were standing by the swimming pool. And the person was proudly telling them that in the case of, of an earthquake, that this would become one of the water sources, so we've already got water here that we can use, and this is a reservoir of water which we will be able to use in earthquakes. Well, we Visitors to the campus, we were standing there with the parents going, okay. Yeah, this is good. I, I mean, this sounds Love really that. good. So we go into a meeting, and it happens to have the, the, you know, the folks who run facilities and all on there, and, and we told them about this, and they said, what? <laughs> I made the statement, good for you guys, that you've got a water supply that will feed your, you take care of your university and the surrounding thing. The, the facilities person, I thought, had a heart attack. What? They're saying that? <laughs> and he went, you can't get up there and make those kind of statements. That might get out in public. And I went... Well, I just went with the campus tour, and that was what they were telling the parents. And he did like that, and the dean of students said, we put that on every tour. Now, they weren't attempting to tell lies. They actually believed that was the truth. But nobody had bothered to check with facilities to find out uh, you can't drink swimming pool water, and we are not set to make it potable. But the point of this is there's a series of things that we look at that we put together in these tools to make these decisions. One are publicly available data because while as academics we love data, we love new data, we want more data, we want to find different data, we love data. If you're in a community who is trying to figure out can I pay teachers more, keep the garbage trucks running on time, repave the roads, keep the water running, and by the way, keep business and economy moving, the last thing you need is a bunch of nerds who come in and say the solution to your problem is you need some more data. Thank you, no. So, but we have, we are data rich and wisdom poor in many cases. So we devised a series of questions and collaborative decision-making tools that let them work from publicly available data that are tied to what we call indicators. This comes out of academic literature that was researched in all the domains of, that make up a community to say what are the sorts of data that are there that if we understood that they said something about resilience, they're indicative of greater or less resilience. So we use these resilience indicators, publicly available data, and the community context to help them get a snapshot of themselves as to how their functionality is working. Communities normalize dysfunctions all the time. May I mention Boston Transit? Does anybody write home to anyone and go, you know, transit here is fabulous. I love the two hours I spend getting to work every day, right? No, we do not. But here, it's normal. We accept it. We just say that's the price of living in Boston. That is a lack of resilience in that indicator because a disaster accelerates trends that are already in place. So if you have a problem before a disruption, you will have a catastrophe afterwards. And that, let me finish this, and then I will... Uh, so we have these indicators and the data that are looked at. We look at then the community held data. Sometimes communities know things that you can't see from data sets. Is that not true, Amanda? <laughs> she spent a lot of time learning about data in Maine lately. Um, and, and that allows us to look at the, not just the context, but the deeper level information around these indicators, coupled with other characteristics, we'll come back to this for opportunity zones, to understand their baseline resilience. What is their normal status of resilience? What are the places that are weak, what are strong, and how are they acting on one another? And then lastly, we can use that with solutions that have potential to change the state of any of those functions. Okay. Just a quick comment on the indicators because we probably get more pushback on the indicators than anything else. And so people will say, how many indicators are there? Well, there are, I don't really have it, there are right now a hundred, let's just say. So there are roughly a hundred. Well, is that all of them? I don't know. 
You know, are they exactly the right ones? I don't know, but I suspect not. Uh, are you willing to look at another one rather than the one you're looking at? Sure. What I know is that the ones that we have that that we have adopted at this point are established in the literature. Somebody has looked at them and said, yeah, we can see a correlation or even a causation between this indicator and some element of resilience. So we can go back and say, or we have learned it from communities because communities have shown that. But I guess the point is, is we're always amenable to adding, subtracting, changing those indicators, but we're very comfortable with the ones that are out there. Right. So the idea that we, what we began with with that curve was to put together these collaborative decision tools because you need the community to talk to itself about it. The other thing that's true is you cannot import resilience by buying an expert. They can buy a plan for a development. They can buy a plan for better, you know, engineered uh, infrastructure. But if they're going to build resilience, they have to own it. And the only way to own it is for them to understand what doesn't work. Because the other problem we deal with in communities, and we all know this because we're all community members, is we live in an age of specialization, right? You used to have dentists. You now have endodontists, orthodontists, protodontists, right? And all of them do a special thing. We do it everywhere in society. Hyper-specialization allows for hyper-competency. We assume that hyper-competency yields a solution that works. But resilience is a networked relational outcome. So I can invest everything I want to invest in education, look at the educational capabilities and capacities of Boston, but I'm still not resilient. I can build the best train system in the world, but it won't make me resilient unless I understand who the people are that need it, where they need to go, when they need to go, what are the constraints around their use of it, how is that going to affect business or education or tourism or anything else. If you don't understand those interdependencies, then you're investing money in a system but not a solution. And resilience is about investing in solutions and understanding how what we do makes a difference. So the idea was to put together the sorts of practically focused decision tools that would allow communities to look at what they already in part know, they just don't understand exactly how the outcomes are happening, right? And we learned from them that, <laughs> it's, it's instructive always to ask people, what is it you think you need, as opposed to, Hi, I'm from someplace else and I'm here to help you. Uh, what they needed, that we learned from uh, years of uh, talking with them in a very focused, uh, targeted way, was most people don't understand what it means to be resilient. So again, they resort, resort to one of these other solution pathways we just talked about. Let me have a specialty, I'll do that, I'll do this, I'll do something else. Um, they don't understand where they are in resilience. They think they're a great place to live, so they hope that means their resilience. And most, as a human coping mechanism, assume it means they're resilient. That's why after disasters, the newspapers are full of people who are complaining about what emergency management did or didn't do. Um, but it's because they don't understand the resilient framework that they're working in or how resilient their city is or isn't. There was a major hurricane that was going to hit Galveston, Texas. Galveston is low-lying. It has suffered one of the worst disasters in U.S. history back at the turn of the 20th century. You don't have to be a you know, rocket scientist to know Galveston is going to get wet, seriously. The city manager sent people door to door. They knocked on the door and said, Lauren, are you going to evacuate when we tell you to evacuate? And Lauren, it being smart, Lauren said, yes, of course, I will immediately, right? And, but if Lauren's roommate said, well, you know, Lauren's going, but I'm staying, then they made a note, and they tried to talk them into going. There was a young couple who refused to evacuate. After the storm was over and they were cut off for days, the, the city was really hammered, and it was four or five days, nobody could get back to the island. They are on the front page of the newspaper Mad as hornets. And here was the statement in the newspaper. 
They told us that we might die. They didn't tell us we were going to be without power for five days. And you're going to get, really? This is the way your logic works? It's okay to stay and you might die, but if you're going to be without power, you're hacked off? It's because they don't understand resilience and where they are. They also wanted tools that would let them understand how to choose these solutions. This is obviously a cartoon of a community. It does not have all the things on it that communities actually have, but it has a good portion of them. And they cover everything, right? We've got emergency management, roads, water, government, public services, business, economic development, power, telecom. These are, you ever thought about what life is like when there is no internet and telecom? It's a sad place these days, really sad. Colleges, libraries, schools, news and media, health, housing, arts and entertainment, faith-based, civic, social capital, sports and recreation. Your community cannot function unless all of those things are functioning. And your community cannot be as resilient as it needs to be unless all of these things are resilient. So that loss recovery curve and that set of tools, we began to put together indicators that are tied to data on all of these domains. And the decision tools allow the communities then to interrogate their state of resilience and identify solutions that advance it. So that's kind of the methodology and idea behind what we're working towards with communities, what we want them to achieve. The problem is, as we would talk to communities and they would you know, get energized and do all of this and they would go, gosh, we need a thingamabob to get more resilient, but that is very expensive and we don't have the money for that. And so then the community would grind around and trying to figure out what to do next. Well, in 2017, the game changed in terms of mechanics and mechanisms for helping communities become more resilient. And Warren's going to talk to you a bit about opportunity zones and how that affects what we're doing in communities today. We'll do this rather quickly because it's very important to GRI and it's where GRI has put a lot of its effort in the last uh, bit of time. Uh, it is only one way uh, that we go after helping communities uh, to be resilient. Uh, Robin talked about actually the system that was put together and we're comfortable with the indicators, we're comfortable with the community engagement. We actually know from experience that we can go into a city and working with that or into a community, and whatever size that community is, we actually didn't address that up front. One of the hard problems in the very beginning is, okay, so what do you mean by community? Uh, because that can be really, really difficult. Can a community, you know, is it a neighborhood? Uh, yeah. Is it a city? Yeah. But in, in all cases, we were talking about a geographic community. And we used to say it's, it's sort of, it is a geographic community that's held together by common interest. And those common interests are largely, but not exclusively economic. So we probably should have said that up front. So, uh, so we're talking about not communities of interest, we're talking about geographic communities, polities in most cases that, that exist out there. But so we, we know because we've gone into those communities, we've worked with the communities, we've used those indicators, we've taken them through a process where they did an assessment, but we helped them do an assessment on those indicators, and they actually came out with an understanding of what their, what their resilience was, what their resilience shortfall was, and what their needs were. And then, as Robin said, it always gets down to the, yeah, but how do I pay for this? So in the Tax Acts of 2017, a, a really interesting provision was tacked onto that Tax Act, and it was called, um, they were called Opportunity Zones. And the governors of each state got to nominate uh, a number of census tracts, and, and let, me, let me make sure you understand that word, census tracts that could be designated as opportunity zones. And it ended up there were 8,764 of them across the nation, which were designated uh, or, or nominated by governors and then affirmed by the Treasury Department are qualified, and they became qualified opportunity zones. Now, there's a couple of interesting things in that before I get into how the law works. First of all, you've heard us talking about resilience, and you understand how pervasive resilience is and how it affects everything around it. So there is no infrastructure that I can think of being, uh, whether it's a built infrastructure, an economic infrastructure, or a social infrastructure, that stops at a census tract boundary. So when, you know, so I, okay, I'm going to, I can make an investment in a census tract, 
But the fact is, is that the water doesn't stop at the census tract boundary, the water system. And the social system doesn't, and the economic system uh, doesn't. So we've got a little disparity when we think about this between the geography of what a community is and where that uh, opportunity zone is and how we use the opportunity zones. But the elements of the opportunity zones are really pretty simple. Once a, government, a governor had nominated them and the Treasury uh, Department had validated them or qualified them, then they became uh, eligible for gigantic tax incentives if you invest in them. So they run something like this, at, very simply. If you take equity that you already have and you transfer it into an opportunity zone in some kind of an investment, and it can be a broad series of investments, so it can be a real estate investment, that's the one people focus on most. It can be a business investment. It can be an infrastructure investment. You know, you could build a solar farm there, or you could improve the water station or something like that if you can figure out how to make money out of doing that. But all of that equity that you transfer into there would normally be eligible for capital gains taxes. In this case, you defer those capital gains taxes for 10 years. Now, to you and me, that ain't a real big deal. But to a big institutional investor or to a big high wealth investor, that's a really big deal that I'm not going to encumber uh, up to 20% of my money for, for a period of 10 years. And, oh, by the way, if you hold that investment for 10 years, then your, your, uh, your tax on that, on that goes down substantially at the end of that 10 years. So that in itself is a tremendous advantage for big investors. But that's not the big one. The big one is, is that all the profits that are derived on that investment over that 10-year period are tax-free. So if I build a building in there today for a million dollars, and 10 years from now it's worth $3 million, I've made a $2 million profit, and it's tax-free money. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Or if you invest in a startup that happens to be Google. Right. Uh, and at the end of 10 years, Google is worth... Forty bazillion dollars, then you've got forty bazillion dollars that is tax-free. So the potential here, uh, I mean, estimates of up to six point one trillion dollars are sitting out there in in capital that could be released. Nobody believes that six point one trillion dollars is going to flow into opportunity zones, but hundreds of billions of dollars is not unrealistic that could flow into these opportunity zones. Now. Uh, there are 13 in Boston, 138 in Massachusetts, as I said, 876 across the nation. The really interesting thing about this is that sounds really good, but there aren't any rules. Or the only rules are IRS rules. So there's, you know, normally when we have programs like this, HUD is in charge or uh, Department of Health and Human Services are in charge or somebody like that is in charge about writing the rules so we can figure out because the purpose for these, that the sponsors who, who put these in the bill, the purpose was, how do I help disadvantaged communities become more ad ad advantaged? How do I help these census tracts? By the way, I, the census tracts that were designated had to be in a certain income range. So they were, you know, so they had to be disadvantaged uh, census tracts to begin with. So how do I, uh, the purpose was, how do I get money flowing into places where money is not normally going to flow so that I can help these, these areas that have been disadvantaged for years become better. But there are no rules that cause me to have to do that. So the only rules are accounting rules. The only rules are I've got to make the investment. The investment's got to sit there for 10 years. It's got to be in a qualified opportunity zone. And if I do that and I am successful, I get the tax break even if it destroys the community that I've just put the investment in. So if I go into a low-income area where housing is already a problem and I build a big office building and that displaces all the people who used to be there and now they have no place to live and they have to go someplace else, I still get my tax advantage. And our point has been really pretty simple. I honestly don't care if rich people get richer. I'm okay with that. I don't have a problem with it at all. But I'd like a lot if some of the rest of us kind of got some advantages out of them getting richer at the same time. So one of the things that we have chartered ourselves to do, and look at this, is how can we actually ensure economic development occurs for all the people in that, which means that we've got to look at the community around these opportunity zones, not just the opportunity zone, and how is the investment in that opportunity zone 
going to affect that region around the opportunity zone in a positive way and be willing to say, yes, it does, or no, it doesn't. And oh, by the way, go ahead to the next slide, Robin. Oh, by the way, we really have to consider the investor in all of this, too, because we want the investor to do this. We want the investor to invest in the money. So our analysis using those indicators and that data and the community engagement allows us to do a couple of things. It allows us to look at an area and baseline the area and say, he, around this, you know, based around this opportunity zone, because remember, we can't just do the opportunity zone because it influences everything around it. But in the area that we describe around this opportunity zone, what's needed? What's the resilient status of this area today? What's the baseline? How do we understand that baseline? And based on that, what are the gaps and shortfalls and what are the recommendations we could make around what you could invest in that would actually create, let's say, economic development? It's not just economic development. We're trying to do resilience, but we're, we're interested in, in investors being you know, doing well here also. So what's actually going to make a difference to, those, to those, those areas? So when we were down in New Orleans, for instance, we were asked to look at several uh, zones in New Orleans. And uh, very quickly, New Orleans East, the part east of the river out toward Mississippi, just sort of jumps out at you. Devastated by Hurricane Katrina. I had a thriving community out there before Hurricane Katrina, had retail businesses out there, shops and restaurants and all. Katrina came through, wrapped all of that, wiped all of that out, has never come back. It's become a displacement area for gentrification in the city, so people are moving out there. It has terrible transportation. It has unreliable power. Uh, I mean, th there is no way that I would go invest money out there just looking at it, except it now has some massive opportunity zones, it sits between the Port of New Orleans, third of all raw materials in the United States pass through the Port of New Orleans. None of, almost none of them stop off in Louisiana to be processed. They go somewhere else. It's got the Michoud, did I say that right? Michoud, uh, NASA assembly facility sitting down at the other end of it. Space travel is taking off again. The space program is moving hard again. They do things out there that can't be done anywhere in the nation. It's got tremendous land that's available to do this. Everything is out there that if you can leverage those opportunity zones in the right way, you could make transformational change in East New Orleans. So that's the kind of thing we're looking at in, in trying to do a baseline. But at the same time, we've got to be able to tell the investor, this is how you protect your investment that's out there. Because he's not going to invest unless you can show him that, that the conditions are being set for him to have a good investment out there. So what you need is a plan. You need a strategic plan using, that uses the opportunity zone as a catalyst for transformational change in that area. Value for both, both sides. I thought you were just on a roll. So if you think about then the, both the decision tool and that framework with the indicators and the way that it works with, towards this collaborative decision making, and what the community is beneath that, then we can put all of this together so that they get, they have a framework that helps bridge the interest from the investors and the community. So the community doesn't have to feel like this is something that is happening to them. Do you all like to have things happen to you? Most of us know. We want to be part of what is happening, right? And so it, resilience and this framework and indicators becomes an objective lens that allows the community and the investors to both work together, talk together, and look at how they're going to make decisions around solutions. It gives them a picture that they can uh, look at the solution set and understand their own readiness for investment. How many of you have ever been around a tech incubator that did not work? They, they used to be, they're the favorite thing where they're going to help a disadvantaged area. We're going to put in a tech incubator. Okay, fabulous. You know, that'll work for all the tech people who are going to then have to transit to the place or to move there. But you may not be helping folks in the community actually advance their lives. So what the resilience 
outcome or the resilience assessment helps them understand is, here's the things that can make a difference. Curate local businesses. Put in, uh, in New Orleans, we talked about, uh, you know, you've got jazz musicians who were born in some of these areas. They all go down to the French Quarter to play, but you could have clubs here that do the same thing. Broaden the area that has the attractiveness. Look for your local Cajun flavor that people are coming to New Orleans for anyway. Put, let's invest in those businesses, right? Uh, we had one city that put in restaurant incubators, which I thought was a stroke of genius. Denver has one, Tulsa has one. So that people who want to be in the food service industry come to a place that has all these little areas that each uh, restaurateur, hopeful, entrepreneur can open. They can all eat out in a common hall and you try a bunch of different places and when that restaurant gets enough clients and knows how it's going to do its thing to be solving, it moves out and gets its own business. That's the kind of thing that will be, bring economic development. It'll put local community together and it will keep what makes the community special there? So that, that's the sort of thing that they can get from applying this strategy. And then the strategy also looks at, okay, you need to do these things. You need, you're going to have to improve transit. You're going to have to bring in local business. And by the way, you're going to have to do something about your energy because you can't fix the whole economy of the community if everybody's having to pay so expensive energy costs, right? Once they do that, then you can look at and say, where's the money coming from? Some of the money can come from this tax-advantaged investment. Some money can come from public programs. Some money can come from local business. So it helps them stack the resources and apply them in ways that are effective across the community. So that's what we're working on in Opportunity Zones. And that opportunity zone is just a mechanism that lets us help communities advance their resilience. So what does resilience do when we really get it right in communities? It changes your competitive stature because resilient communities are more competitive. It is action-oriented and not reactionary. Disaster recovery, by definition, is reactionary. What you want is to invest ahead of it. It creates a culture and a mindset. So all of you all who looked sheepish when I said, do you have a plan for what you will do in an emergency? Go home and get one. It may be three steps, but do it. Figure out where you're going to go, how you're going to get there. And if you can't go, have enough cans of, I don't know, lima beans or something that uh, you can live off of, right? Have a plan. Be part of a culture of resilience. It will help to minimize the disruption. It helps to free up ordinary operational dollars that can be applied to problems. We have spent for the last five years collectively $350 billion a year on disaster events. If we weren't spending that much money, it could be invested in curing cancer, advancing education, figuring out Boston Transit, you know, there's a lot of things that we could be used for if we weren't just recovering. So it adds value not just to what we do when a disruptive event occurs, but it makes everyday life and operations better and more smooth. So that's the story, and happy to take any questions quickly if you all want to uh, have questions or comments. Otherwise... Yes. It does. Um, it's a good thing you asked that question. They're all thrilled, I can tell. Um, let me just show you this picture. This is a functional loss recovery curve that we talked about in the beginning. One of the things that we point out, and the, the idea of this, of this graphic is, this is community function going along day to day. And it may be increasing slightly. Most communities like to think we're advancing slowly and making progress, right? But beneath that curve, we have normalized some dysfunction in almost every community. Some communities more than, than others. Poverty is a dysfunctional element that expresses in communities that we normalize in a lot of different ways. Different communities do different things. When an event disruptor happens, 
then a lot of that dysfunction gets both amplified and it becomes an amplifier of some of the other expressions. So one of the early things that we got asked was, you know, can, does this cure poverty? Well, no, not on its own, of course not. But understanding how the lack of resources, the length of time for resource, you know, the, if you've got long-standing disadvantaged places like most of these opportunity zone districts, then the way that that poverty and lack of resources is affecting the other functions of the community is different. And it also means then that there are different choices that can be made and invested in in order to change that curve, in order to change the recovery curve. But it is, again, that it expresses differently in other, in, from community to community, there are some things that are the same. Do you want to say something about that? Patty. Sure. So one of the things we assess when we look at communities is what do they already know, what are they already doing? Most communities are doing some things, some communities are doing lots of things. Um, there is a quote attributed to Oliver Crom Cromwell that says, the side of the gallows doth wonderfully focus the mind. And communities who have seen the gallows, they've been slapped by a hurricane or an earthquake or they had their major employer leave town all at once, they get real focused in a hurry about how do you, what's the game changing you know, aspect of this. So you have to look at the community, understand where they are, because the other thing to remember resilience is a journey. You don't ever just get there and go, man, I have finally, I am resilient. It's, you're always getting better. And so you understand where they are, you look at what they've got, and then we had in our original community work a whole program around these are ways to talk about resilience. These are things you ought to do. One of the things we analyzed and understood is that most people believe information based on how it is transmitted to them. So the ex example was in this particular coastal community, they could not get people to evacuate using evacuation routes. Do you all know we have evacuation routes here? They're marked and where you live. They stop at the city boundary, unfortunately. Yeah, right. Okay. They couldn't get people. Whoops. Uh, they couldn't get people to use the evacuation routes, so they invested thousands of dollars in radio spots to say, "You need to really use your evacuation route, and your evacuation route is going to go out that back door. So we want you to use that." Right? Still no uptake. They finally go to a community and talk to them, and they said, "Well, the problem is you're using radio, and nobody in this community listens to the radio." And the second problem is, if you want them to believe that they're going to have to use that evacuation route, then you're going to have to have the community mothers tell them that. So they said, well, uh, who are the community mothers? And those got identified to them. They were matriarchal leaders of the community. And they went to them and explained, here's the problem, here's what we need, here's the route, here's what we'd like. And they went, Got it. So you have to understand those, we found out there's a whole social, informal, we called them a soft communication network. Guess who young moms believe? Other soccer moms. But you know, they'll, they'll believe it from their faith-based leader. So you have to understand who needs to send the message, how they like to hear it, and what we recommend to the emergency management folks is map your informal network of communication and use it. Because guess what? They can also tell you stuff you don't know. And you see it now in social media all the time. Been a number of uh, uh, events in the last five years where resources and immediate response things are actually marshaled straight up by social media. And, and I, I don't want to stretch this out, but that is clearly how you get at the individual and how you change the culture individually. But I would maintain that the biggest changes that happen in a community that make it more resilient, uh, while individual is critical and important, the biggest changes that can be made are not at that level. They're made at the governmental level and at the private business level because they're the people who can actually create 
significant resilience and significant change in there. Not, not to diminish the individual at all. I always say nothing scientific. I break communities into three parts. There's the government, there's the private business sector, and there's all the rest of us. And the fact is, if you want to get people to play in this, all the rest of us are the people you can normally get to play. We'll come to meetings, we'll sign up, we'll do all of that stuff. But getting government and private business to work together to make truly transformational change, to change, to, to look at how the infrastructure works and change that infrastructure and make it more resilient, to look at how the business has worked and how the businesses influence individual behavior becomes pretty important. And so another way that I think we get at this, particularly in the system, is as we've said along, this is a collaborative process. So this is not a matter of us coming in and saying, here's where you're broken, here's where you're, et cetera. It's a matter of us coming in and working with you and saying, here's what we've seen Here's how you have helped us put it in context. Let's discuss this and figure out what we can do. It's amazing the learning that happens in that collaborative process. As a matter of fact, I would suggest that in a true collaborative process where you're working with the community, you're working with committees in the community, both public and private and organizational and those kinds of things, most of the effective change in learning happens as a result of the process and not of the product at the other end. management people early on <laughs> confessed that at the moment that Katrina hit their emergency response plan was safely locked in a safe which floated away. Um, <laughs> so to me that kind of said everything. Anything else? Because obviously he and I can talk about this forever. So No we can't. One of us has an airplane to catch. All right. <laughs> Thank you all for being here.